Imagination TV is back for another day. We've done like 900 episodes or it feels like it. We're seven or eight months into various stages of lockdown and complexity around the world. And over the, we're in the middle smack bang now in a two-week special period where we're bringing everybody together from in and around the AM ecosystem and much uh, wider afield to talk about the world we imagine in the next 10 years. So we've worked on trying to shift the paradigm around inequality to try and design a fairer world and, and be engineers on the ground working with people to, to unlock their imagination, unlock their power and skills to organise change and implement it for the last 16 plus years. And today we're, we're going to reflect on the world we're imagining in uh, 10 years time. And it's part of a celebration that we're doing as part of our uh, global hoodie day that we're celebrating the 10th year of making a, a hoodie or a sweatshirt, depending on which part of the world you come from. And on the back of this year's hoodie, it says some of the things that we're imagining in 10 years' time. So we're imagining zero waste houses. We're imagining a school classroom where teachers have unlocked their imaginative framework so kids aren't being left outside the margins. We've found different ways to communicate to different thinkers and different cultures and different kids within a classroom. We're imagining more complex supply chains and that we've worked out more sustainable ways to do clothing and do fashion. We're imagining different economic models that consider kindness and consider empathy and consider time. And we're imagining, hopefully, complex souls to complex problems around climate change and a more sustainable life that we've built for each other as human beings and then also for the other animals that get to share this world with us and all the other species and all of the other um, creatures that get to be a part of life on Earth. So that's what we're imagining in a decade. Pretty small task. We've got Maria joining us as a co-host today. Maria, you're a mentor with us at the University of Canberra. Thank you for joining us. How are you feeling about mentoring, about being a co-host today? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm feeling excited, a little bit nervous, but um, glad we get to do this together. Let's turbocharge that imagination of yours. Let's put in, let's let's pull fear away. Let's pull shame away. Let's put in um, about three ounces of kindness. Let's put in a lot of yes and attitude into your brain and then cast your brain forward 10 years from now. What's something that you'd like to imagine that's happened? Oh, that's a really good question. In Something that I'd like to imagine. That Maybe just, um, so I'm a psychology student, so this might be my psychology brain talking, but I really would like to see a world where everyone just listens to each other very open-mindedly. Yeah, I think there's a huge <laughs> space in that area that the grey space is what we've been referring it to, is trying to find where do we go for complex discourse? Where do we go to talk about ideas when we don't have answers? Where do we go where it's safe to be wrong, uh, where we're not pushed to one side via labels very quickly, whether it's black, white, right, wrong, um, left, right, and trying to work out, can we be complex and try and go on a, on a process of discovery because we're, we want to know what, 
Hawks on the other side. And, and that's enough to just ask those questions. A uh, few big topics we're going to kick around. We've got a couple of friends that are joining us to wrap on Hoodie Day on the other side of this video. Fiona, tell us what, what you're imagining putting on this year's hoodie and thinking about what's 10 years from now. Um, I think one of the reasons why I really loved the hoodie as soon as I saw it, um, I think the brightness and uh, has and the, the wording and the script and the design all over it, I think has a massive impact straight away. Um, I think the first thing I said to Louise was that I think it's a really good conversation starter because straight away I think people will come up to me and say, what is, what is this all about? Um, so I think it will get um, some conversations going. Um, as far as what I think about in the next 10 years, I would hope that, uh, uh, as Maria said before, I hope that there's a lot more open discussion, um, a lot more open-mindedness when it comes to um, these kind of topics, um, that everybody is treated fairly. Um, and that conversation, maybe this conversation might actually be redundant. Who knows? Mm. Louise, what do you think? 10 years from now, what's your mystery ball got for us? Get my mystery ball out. Um, I think, like, it's all about respect, right? That we all treat each other um, equally, no matter, to your point, what colour, what gender, whatever, that we're all equal. And, and yeah, we don't need to be having these conversations because people feel valued and empowered to make a difference, no matter who they are or what their background is. Um, so, yeah, I think it's about getting, getting that, this, that we're redundant. We don't have to have these conversations anymore. Yeah, very cool. Well, let's see what the power of those two hoodies uh, have in your lives and the way you connect with people. Yesterday, we had a fascinating conversation around hoodie economics and looking at what role this garment is playing in changing people's behaviour uh, as they wear it, as they impact other people and thinking slightly differently to the way that we might go and buy a, a hooded sweatshirt for $70 on a website and that's transactional. But the transaction with this one is you know, sometimes people volunteer hours upon hours and our next guest has flown across America to come to the launch of, of AIM globally and given up time, time and time again. And in reward, Tyre, you've got a, a hoodie to, to exchange in that. What has it meant to you to get a hoodie along the way of doing work with us um, and, and committing your time and your energy? Yeah, it's a huge thing. I mean, the hoodie to me represents so many things. It's the evolution of AIM over the years from showcasing young mentees artworks to, like you said, sharing the program globally. Um, but I think the message is still very much the same. It's still about bridging the gap of education, inclusivity. But for me, the most important thing that the hoodie represents to me is, um, is identity. I feel like it's about knowing who you are and um, recognizing that, being proud of that, having conviction, and I guess wearing it on your sleeve as well. What's, uh, what's that hoodie that you're wearing now Imagine about and, and what does imagination mean to you? This imagination hoodie is from the film that's coming out, which is an epic, epic uh, initiative, uh, I guess, to bring all these collective people together from different walks of life. Um, we're talking about the prime minister, um, musos. I never thought we'd all be in one writing room together making a film. Uh, and it's about uh, creating change and creating a fair world. So, um, Imagination for me is all linked to the things that, that AIM um, stands for, which is hope and, and uh, a better, fairer world. Yeah, well, the, the film's been a lot of fun. So we, we kickstart as part of Imagination TV. We've thrown our imagination um, as far as we can and, and we launched an open Google Doc about three months ago. And for a month on the TV show with kids, with guests, with Tayo came on and uh, former Prime Minister in Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, came on. Delika Mandela, um, Nelson's granddaughter, came on the show. We had writers from around the world and we built this script from nothing. We just had a title called Imagine and we've, we've written a feature film. 
And then in the last two months, uh, we've been honing it in more and more focused and, and we're starting to get to a place where we're going to go into taking it out to creators to make it as a patchwork from nothing, which has got these contributions of hundreds of kids. There's been 20,000 people in the audience over the course of that month, uh, writers and big names all the way through. And uh, yeah, it's really fascinating what you can do when you when you use that imagination and then you jump to the start of something. So Ty, thank you for imagining with us and being a part of, of creating that action. And thank you, Fiona and the team at Citibank for, for being a part of it as well. Thanks for letting us come on the journey. Yeah, All thank good. you. All right, let's jump into our, our panel. They're going to join us on the other side. How are we going, Maria? Are you learning anything yet? Yep, going good. And I'm excited to hear about our pan from our panelists as well. Awesome. Well, let's jump to this video and then we'll see them on the other side. If you don't want to work, don't bother dreaming. Shame is just nothing. All of us have dealt different cards, and those cards can be awful, but it's what you do. You are responsible for your reaction. Okay, I'm going to kickstart us. Uh, what do we imagine in 10 years' time? So specifically, what we are imagining in our world is we want to launch a university, uh, and we don't want to just do it in 10 years' time. We want to do it in about... 10 weeks time, give or take. So on the 11th of January next year, we want to launch a university called Imagination University that trains people around the world in imagination and organising change, that brings together a complex social network of a five-year-old kid in Nigeria through to a 95-year-old graduate with seven degrees in India, to a CEO from a major bank through to a high school teacher. Because one of the things that's missing at the moment is that complex social network. So what we're imagining is creating a virtual digital university experience for five days at the start of January and then having 10 months worth of practical assignments for people to go out and organise change and be organised in these complex social networks in different fields, be it from design, artistry, uh, through to having young people being organised on the ground and creating change. So that's our big idea for, for 10 years from now. Let's go around the panel and see what do we imagine in 10 years as a big idea that we'd like to see create and change and tell us a little bit about yourselves. Julie, kick us off. Sure. Thanks so much, Jack. I'm so happy to join you uh, and to take part in this awesome conversation and uh, uh, with all the awesome videos. I'm just so jealous. I don't have the hoodie yet, so <laughs> I hope it's going to change. It's coming. Soon. It's coming. Post show. Yeah. It'll be on its way. There's a few challenges with shipping at the moment, which you can't control. Yeah, sure. Um, what? Do, how do I imagine the world in 10 years? Uh, well, definitely uh, equality. Uh, among you know all humans and that's why I'm working a lot on this network that we all call internet uh, how can we make sure to leverage I'm sorry I have guests behind me but it's fine how can we make sure to leverage that um, space and make it bene beneficial for everyone uh, for everyone to have access to knowledge because we know that equality comes first from access to information from the possession of information and the ability to share it. So definitely uh, a university, a digital university does make a lot of sense uh, and the ability for anyone anywhere in the world to equally be able to access knowledge, but also experts and also become themselves experts later on. Well, we, we, can, we can definitely work on that university together. So let's, let's do that as a takeout. Um, practically, tell me a little bit more about internet uh, and what you're working on. Sure, uh, we are Internet Without Borders. So uh, we work on access to internet and also freedoms on the internet. Uh, first of all, access. We all know that today, half the population of the world is still not connected to the internet. Not because they don't want to, but because it's too expensive. That's the first thing. Uh, and the other thing is, even when they have access to internet, uh, they don't have access to a quality internet that would allow them to do what we're doing now live stream and participate in a, in a live TV show. Uh, that's the first thing we do. And we also do, once people have access to the, to the platform, we want to make sure they have the ability to, well, use their freedoms, freedom of expression being the first one, being able to say whatever you want to, uh, provided, of course, that it's respectful of, of others and others' freedoms in general, uh, that you can also share your opinions, uh, form your opinions, and, um, and even 
peacefully assemble, you know, demonstrate online. When you sign a petition, for instance, that's the right to, to demonstration, basically. So um, we, we, yeah, we work on, on this front. Uh, sorry about that. I didn't. <laughs> Don't be sorry at all. It's good, it's, good, it's good to have some reality. This is, this is yeah. completely real. I, I want to pick up this idea of freedom. Gaurav, tell me a little bit about what you think freedom is uh, and, and what are we, because it's a big idea and a big concept. When you do the work that you're doing, um, what, what, if any, role does, does a pursuit of freedom for the people that you're working with uh, play in, in your thinking and preparation around it? Sure, sure. Thanks, Dick. It's a privilege to be here. So in terms of freedom, I'll say freedom to me and the way we work is uh, freedom to be yourself, right? In this world, the way the society is built, the way we have built this world, we're trying to change everyone. We want to fit everyone into a structure, into a labeling, right? That's one of the biggest problems uh, we face, right? So freedom is the freedom to be what you are. The work we're doing is more around education. And then we believe that uh, education should be driven by own curiosity. So uh, again, anyone who discovered anything in the past in the history was driven by the inner desire to know. Somewhere along the line, we have moved from curiosity to curriculum. It's not that a student tells us what they want to learn. We tell them what we want to teach them. There's no way they can we can teach them effectively or they can be a good learner. So I think our whole work is moving education away from curriculum to curiosity and in this process we say that you have freedom to be whatever you want that's the uh, core of freedom that i think what and what a crazy idea that 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 we we have to then teach that because we we start with so much freedom uh we start with so much expression we start with so much curiosity and we have seemingly like an endless supply of imagination. It's just this unbelievable asset. We had a, a young student yesterday who was a co-host and he spoke about being at school, uh, that you choose your subjects as you get older and then suddenly you choose your university degree off some of the subjects you like and you're narrowing your field of thinking. You're narrowing your expertise, sometimes from age like 12 onwards, if not earlier. And I, I, I fundamentally agree after, you know, working with kids for 16 years as, a, as an educator, I think our gift is to unlock curiosity. Our gift is to try and have a life being about opening your mind every single day to something new. And if, if you can, in that pursuit, uh, find a way to be peaceful with yourself uh, and find joy in, in your own being, then that might be what we're here for. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Really interested in the work that, that you're doing. And Anth, tell us a little bit about what being means to you, how do, how do you be in the world and how do you engage with, with this idea of being and being a human being? Being a human being, gosh. Well, it's um, quite often, you know, I catch myself thinking like, what's so special about being human? Um, and, you know, the usual answers that pop up are like, you know, human beings use language, that we are cultural beings, that we collaborate across different groups. But I think it's something that you just said, Jack, that's, the, the kernel of human exceptionalism or what makes us as a species unique. And that is that we are voraciously and serially curious. So for me, the being of human being is to be interested in uh, the world external to ourselves, but also um, in tune with uh, how we're experiencing that world. So being, I think, is the process of curious relationships that individuals make with the world and each other. And doesn't curiosity make you crazy? What a, that's an open question to the panel. Is it how, how do you stop with curiosity? You know, if you're suddenly learning about this thing and you open another door and open it, how do you, how do you make sense of all the information when you're forever curious? And um, this has become a therapy session for me now. So <laughs> jump in with it. <laughs> if you need help, Jack, uh, we can help you. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping for it. Let's go. Now, can I jump in rapidly? Yeah, you're touching on something very important there. When we talk about access to information and all that, the amount of information now, uh, we rapidly talk about another phenomenon now, which is sharing of fake news. You know, the fact that increasingly people share information without, you know, verifying it. And uh, this challenge has pushed societies around the world to reflect more on yeah, what what it what what what's the effect of having suddenly access to information in such 
a short amount of time. I mean, historically, this has never happened. Uh, and uh, especially if you think about societies, uh, repressive regimes, where for instance, you have one medium uh, that for years has provided information to everyone and suddenly you have Wikipedia, you have Facebook, you have all, all of this, you know, platforms and, and, and spaces where you can get information. And definitely people are increasingly talking about digital literacy, but also information literacy. So not only having access to the information, but also how to receive it and developing critical thinking, questioning always whatever you come across uh, and whatever you learn from, from while, you know, wandering on the, on the online space. I think that notion of literacy without being, you know, without trying to lecture anyone, but just saying that, yes, we should use our critical thinking all the time, especially now. How do we think critically, Gaurav? Yeah, I would say that uh, that judgment that uh, that comes with the experience. So unless we open people to new avenues, we give them more opportunities, we give them the right uh, guidance, the next generation of students will not come up with that kind of uh, critical thinking, right? We can't stop information spread. If you go to a city, uh, kind of India, where even in smaller cities, if, even if you say, oh, they don't have uh, access to a lot of education, they still have access to WhatsApp videos. And uh, as Jiri was mentioning, those fake news get forward. But if you don't give them exposure to kind of the judgment, that guidance, they are taking their own view about those fake news. So I think we need to give them more exposure, more guidance, more mentoring, where they can develop that right kind of judgment before they enter the work, before they enter the uh, real world, so that they, they can themselves judge what is right and wrong. But somewhere that guidance and mentoring is required in each years. Maria, where, what questions do you have for the panel? Is there anything that's, that's burning away as you're listening in? Well, I actually wanted to touch on something that um, you all kind of um, mentioned, and I think Jackie would said it just in a different way, but something I've um, been applying to my life recently is the question revolving curiosity is what can I open my eyes to today? And I guess my question for the panelists is what's something that you've been opening your eyes to this week or today, or what's something that you're going to open your eyes to in the future? Happy to jump in. <laughs> um, I, you know, ironically, this week I learned about facial recognition and indigenous populations in Australia. This is something that I really had no idea about. And I learned yeah. about it through uh, students uh, who have been part of the Bergen Klein Center uh, Summer Institute and who decided to work on this issue. We're all talking about facial recognition in the, in the aftermath of you know, George, George Floyd's death in the US. And it was interesting to see that the debate is also you know, present in other places of the world and particularly in Australia. So yeah, that's what I learned this week and I'm happy. Sure, for, for me, I recently started learning about the communities which are, uh, which we call kind of secluded, cut away from main society. And then we recently he heard about Amazon kind of uh, societies which stay there, those communities which recently got in, uh, affected by COVID. And that brought my attention to a lot of those kind of communities which are there in some part of India, Andaman, Nicobar. So how they stay uh, kind of, how they interact with outer world, how they're still kind of preserving their own culture. That is something which was I was not aware of, not very kind of in tune into. So that's something which I learned and that that uh, kind of sparked my curiosity in that area. So that's the latest thing that I'm trying to learn. Um, I think for me, becoming a new parent um, has been pretty radically transformative. And I think, uh, you know, many of you with kids um, or in close contact with kids will will be nodding your head pretty vigorously to that. And I think for me, what what's really struck me is, you know, looking at this, my, my baby daughter, um, actually seeing how much she enters the world with, uh, that she's actually entered the world, not as a blank slate, but actually with a lot of... Um, yeah, both genetic, but also energetic and temperamental um, energy. And that my job I've learned is not to shape her, but to facilitate who she wants to be. And for me, I've learned that, um, or, or what I want to um, 
do as a parent, as a father, is to facilitate her development rather than to engineer or choreograph something that I think she ought to be. And that uh, might be obvious to many of you parents, but it's been news to me. Yeah, very cool. Uh, definitely the science is behind you, and it's the biggest growth in the brain after adolescence is when you have your first child. So you're, you're in the mix of me. Hang in there. Um, well, have you guys got any questions for each other, the, the panel? Yeah, I guess I um, wanted to ask folks, because you mentioned, Jack, you know, how do you, you know, what is critical thinking? And I jotted down really quickly, um, you know, an exposure to viewpoint difference, but then we can't just, it can't just be about difference. So I, I put to myself this idea of curiosity with discernment. So you're curious, and to your point, Julie, around fake news, how do you be more discerning? How do you figure out like what's a, a, a valid or reliable source and what really isn't? And it reminds me of the Indian philosophy, the, the point of viveka, the, the, the fact of discernment. So yeah, just thinking about how does curiosity and discernment um, work with each other? Because I think there is a productive tension there. I, I completely uh, agree, uh, Anand. And I would even say um, that's, yeah, that's the heart of so many discussions now um, when we talk about uh, information online in general. Um, but um, the problem from my perspective is that, you know, that the notion of discernment is currently defined by governments. And unfortunately, not all of them, you know, have, um, you know, at heart, the interest necessary of, necessarily of citizens and, you know, public knowledge and public access to information. So yeah, that's a, that's a huge challenge. Sorry, I always, um, it's not that I'm pessimistic at all, but it's just that, you know, trying to see different, different angles all the time. Uh, but one thing that, that, that struck me and, and I was hoping also we could, discuss that, uh, still talking about discernment. I was wondering if other panelists, uh, since we're talking also to young audiences, whether or not different panelists have a sen the sense that, yes, there's definitely a difference probably in the way, you know, young people now uh, of this generation, you know, digital generation, could we probably say, uh, have the relationship they have with information and also, yeah, the way they also shape information and expertise. I, I mean, I'm fascinated by that. Uh, fascinating by all these movements that have been started by you know younger people and that have you know global, national and global impact. So, yeah, I was curious to know what other things uh, about that. Gaurav, do you want to jump in? Sure, sure. I think uh, I'm very optimistic about this. I think this generation has a lot of access to information which we never had, right? Uh, so I'm very optimistic. Uh, with the power of all this information, there's always a risk. As you said, fake news is out there. There are a lot of uh, information out there. And one of the biggest challenges that all this information overload presents, which I think you quickly touched upon, Ajay, that how do you no, uh, Jackie Dunn, what is correct? How do you contain your curiosity? Those are challenges which this information overload brings. And these challenges are partly due to we as a parent, as a guardians are also dealing this first time. We have no way to kind of tell them how to deal with this, right? We are also learning along with them. So first thing is we need to be very, very open. We need to accept that just being a kind of a senior generation, older generation, we don't have all the answers. So let's not try to give them answers. It's an exploratory phase. That's where we need to explore. But I'm very, very optimistic. This generation is coming with a, when I deal with a lot of students, uh, those who are coming out of college or those who are in schools, I think this generation will ultimately turn out to be much smarter. Although the challenge will stay that how do they deal with a kind of overload of information? That's where I think our role will come as being more open and telling them, okay, we are exploring with them. We don't have all the solution, right? With the fake news, the problem is which is the correct news. And maybe there are sources today identifying though this is a correct news, this is not. But trust me, this problem is going to increase. We'll have alternative source which will tell you that 
no, no, this news is correct versus this news. So we are, we are going to enter that. So I think we need to go with open mind and accept that we just being a senior generation may not know all. We need to be an exploratory phase along with them. Well, we have jumped around some big topics in a very short amount of time. Thank you all for, for joining us. I think when we, yeah, when we think about information and, and ideas and critical thinking uh, and engaging with pieces of work, when one of the beauties of the internet is often things happen very quickly. Uh, so there's, there's a pace filter, I think, that's important to, to just acknowledge that most big bodies of complex thinking have taken a serious amount of time, 30, 40 years to publish a really rich text, 40, 50 years of inquiry to, to be a generational artist that we look to who is, who's taken ideas into different places. You know, often the first novel that we read from someone who becomes really successful they've worked on for almost all of their life up until that point. So 40 years of thinking, being, and then creating that work. So I think what the internet then gives us is this access to all of those texts as well, all of those rich, complex texts that have been created throughout human history and working out how we, how we borrow from the guides throughout history and not be consumed by news um, in our digital diet of, of trying to engage with big ideas because there's a lot of people that have um, have done this dancing before us that we can learn from throughout human history. So Gaurav, Ananth, Julie, thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to practically, because we like to talk about things and then do things as well. So we'd love to follow up and talk about Imagination University and see if there's some stuff we can do together in different ways. And, you know, what we're trying to do is curate the complexity of the world and, and help provide information for people to make sense of it. So love the work that you're doing and love to, to see if we can work together on that for next year. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks, Tyson. Thanks a lot. Maria, I love that question. What can I do to open my eyes? What can I open my eyes to today? Thank you for joining us as a co-host and being a part of it. What did you get out of the experience? I got a lot out of this experience. I learned so much from, from all the panelists. So thank you to all of you for sharing your wisdom. Um, I took plenty of notes, so I'm really excited to take on board lots of adapting and to, to the world and all the changes that are going to be coming from our younger generation. Awesome. Well, we have, we have a message now from a, an ambassador of ours for, for Hoodie Day 10 as we look to imagine to the future, and it's a chef named Jock, and Jock's got a, a, a video message for us. So an important question, what are the ingredients for uh, creating change and shifting mindsets? And for me, I think... Uh, two main ingredients, uh, respect, um, without respect, without respect for each other as, as humans, without respect for each other's culture, no matter where in the world that culture comes from, um, we've got nothing. We've got no basis for a conversation. We've got no basis for understanding. And I think it, to me, it seems to be where a lot of the problems start. Um, which brings me on to the second ingredient, which I believe is acknowledgement. And once we form a, a, a level of respect for each other and our differences, um, we can then begin to love and acknowledge those differences. Um, and then the world really starts to change. Um, I see food changing culture uh, and connecting culture so much. I see it every day. Um, gastronomy is uh, one of the greatest avenues for change in culture, I believe, because it is a, a subject, food is a subject that brings people together, no matter the language, the culture, the background, the heritage, the age, the nothing. We can all sit down over a plate of food, um, even a plate of food from a culture that we've never seen before and share an experience, share a moment. Um, and that food seems to sort of bring the walls down. Um, you know, allows us just to, to unshackle uh, and, and equalize. And from that moment comes beautiful things. And um, it's the thing that I can see, it's the thing that I guess, you know, I've sort of fought for uh, here in Australia, which was, if we're gonna have a conversation, let's start it with gastronomy, because it seems to me that when we, we start a conversation through food, um, that, that, that we're in a position where we're all one. We're in a position where we're equal. 
Um, uh, and, and that's the best possible start to any conversation. So ideas that started small and grew into something uh, huge. Um, I'm gonna use this as a crazy example, but an example nevertheless, the compass. Um, sort of invented, uh, and there's a lot of discussion around the exact sort of invention of a compass, but you know, first century Han Dynasty in, in, uh, in China. Um, you know, and originally the compass was sort of used as uh, uh, in sort of, you know, superstition, fortune telling, that kind of thing. And it wasn't sort of, we think, from what I can understand, used for navigation until um, somewhere around about the ninth century. Um, I mean, how did that change the world? All of a sudden, uh, mariners were using compasses to navigate, reaching new shores, discovering new cultures, uh, new conversations and different viewpoints. And how good was that? I mean, that was the beginning of uh, of an understanding that there was more out there than yourself and, and the culture that you were sitting in uh, from many different viewpoints. Uh, I think it was a tremendous uh, invention and it was something that, that really did change the world for the better. I imagine so much for the next 10 years to change the world and you know all of the things that I sort of speak about on a regular basis and we do with our business and our restaurant and and, um, and my family which is uh, the, the, the words of the elders that I've been fortunate enough to spend time on country ringing in my ears. Uh, the first thing, give back more than you take. Um, and I think if you have that mindset going into anything, whether it's your business, whether it's your day-to-day -day, uh, life at work or um, your friends around you, or you know, just at, at some point during the day, just think about that. Um, what are you doing today to give something back um, more than you've received in that day? And, and you know, so many elders have said that to me, give back more than you take. It was, it was one of the first things I heard and it's one of the things that I consistently hear and it's one of the things that, that I try and live by. Um, the second thing, um, again, uh, from, uh, from elders on country is we are all one. And if you just think about that for a second, I mean, just stop the stop the finger pointing stop the you know you're better than us we're better than you or you know just for a second imagine that we are all one and that there are no boundaries that there are no uh you know he's better than us or that's better than what we do or any of that stuff it's just imagine that we are all one and then from there there is this automatic interest and acknowledgement and respect and uh you know from there i believe that we can live in a much better world imagine we are all one is a is a powerful way to end today's episode thank you for joining us uh we'll be back tomorrow as we roll through this special couple of weeks of reflecting on the world that we imagine thanks again to maria for being a part of the show fiona Gaurav, Julie, Anant, and Tai Hara for joining us, and then to Jock for his video just then. I'm looking forward to kicking it with all of uh, our guests and everyone out there in the imagination stratosphere as we look to keep building this fairer world together. So we're going to throw out a video we made a few years ago with a, um, a crew over in France called Cogs as we look to take aim to the world four or five years ago. And, um, yeah, I'm really excited about what the next iteration looks like when we come together and we work on complex social alliances to tackle the challenges of our time over the next decade plus. So Cogs will end the show today and then we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.
Maybe today.